verses 1 to 11. This is our reading this afternoon. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. I am going to read from the English Standard Version. Okay. The Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Let us pray. And Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, thank you for the reminder, O oh Lord, that um, Christ who came to this earth is a, our powerful God, but also a truly man who, who lived and died in our behalf. And because of that, O oh Lord, Christians are justified on the grounds of what he did, on the grounds of what he has achieved, and that is his righteousness. Lord, may we understand this doctrine of justification, and again, may it stimulate uh, in uh, a life of praise. Again, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the 10 year long awaited verdict on the Ampatuan massacre will be out on December 19, and Judge Jocelyn Reyes will hand down the judgment after 10 years of trial. And we all know, we all know the crime that has happened in 2009 where 58 people were shot to their deaths. And, buried in a shallow grave in Ampatuan, Maguindanao. And 30, 32 of those 58 were journalists. So on December 19, we will finally know whether the primary accused will be found guilty or not. If they were found to be the ones who actually did the massacre, then they should be guilty. Now, the whole of mankind too are guilty of constantly disobeying the law of God as per James. For whoever who keeps the law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. So that makes the whole of mankind guilty as well because the law of God tells us that we are all guilty of it, that we cannot and we have constantly disobeyed the law of God. And we need, of course, we, we all know that we need Jesus Christ in order for us to be justified, in order for us to be counted as not guilty. And that is basically the doctrine of justification. Whether you are guilty or not, whether you are condemned or acquitted, guilty or justified, that is a status, that is a legal status. Okay, so just to go back to our order of salvation, we know that from the beginning, election has been done by God the Father, and then the, the rest of the process of the order of salvation are experienced in the human level. And also we can look at it this way, that the election itself is a decree of God, and the salvation itself is applied to us, of course, Christ has accomplished salvation on the cross, but of course, we need, that salvation needs to be applied to every individual. And that is through effectual call, regeneration, and conversion. As we know, effectual call is 
is the call of God the Father. Regeneration is the changing of the of the Holy Spirit changing the heart of the sinner. And then conversion is in the human level or the, the level of the sinner wherein the sinner gets to respond in faith and repentance. And the rest are the blessings. Ito na yung outcome. Ito na yung experience. Ito na yung, uh, na, ito na yung evidence. Ito, ito na yung evidence ng application. Ito na yung fruit of the application. So first is, ito yung tatakal natin this afternoon, justification. Okay? So this is an objective status. Okay, babalikan natin yung kung ano yung mga objective blessings just so we would understand. Okay? So hindi ko napapasadahan ko. Alam natin ito. Again, our topic in our soteriology class is ground of justification. What is the basis of our justification? If we are really Christians, then God justifies us on what grounds? Is it because of our own merit or our own works? Now, in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, and if you have been with us in the past months, you know that we have been studying the book of Ephesians. To be specific, every spiritual blessing. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now Paul made sure that this is in singular. Heaven, uh, spiritual blessing. Because there is a, it is important for us to single out every spiritual blessing. And not to mix them all up. Why? Because first, it will stimulate praise. I mean, if we know that we have been justified, if we know that we have been sanctified, I mean, in, in, in the long process of order of salvation, there are different processes within that word of salutis. And we, we know also that none of those processes involve our own merit, our own works. And we also know that the three persons are at work in that order of salvation. And for us, it should stimulate praise. And deficient knowledge about salvation blessings breeds shallow worship. Okay? Second, of course, to avoid confusion. Justification is not the work of God that changes the heart of the person. What is that work? That changes the heart of the person. Ano dun sa order sa notice yun? Regeneration. Regeneration, yes. <laughs> So at least, so yeah, regeneration yun, okay? So kailangan na lang test, exam. So the implication of this is, of course, there will be confusion, salvation blessings that may lead to vulnerability to false doctrines, okay? Now, nakoy, very important kung ma-confuse natin ang justification sa sanctification. Kung mabaliktad natin yun, I mean, that is the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. That you need to be sanctified in order for you to be justified. But we know that we are justified so that we can be sanctified. Maraming. Uh, Pero, ligas nyo. Praise God. Okay. So that is why we need to single out each spiritual blessing. Now, we need to also distinguish yung objective sa subjective. First, Objective blessings are those blessings that are external to experience. These are the legal status or yung mga declarative status. Ano yung tatlo sa order sa lotis ang objective blessings? Justification. Justification, adoption, sa reconciliation. Objective, lahat yun ay galing sa labas. Hindi sa atin. We are justified by God, adopted by God, reconciled to God. Pare-pareho tayo ng status, hindi magpabago. It will not fluctuate. My justification is the same as your justification. I am adopted to the Father's family just as how you are also adopted. So that, kaya siya objective blessing. That, that is why yung justification itself is an objective uh, blessing. Okay? Now, subjective. 
Those are the blessings that are internal of experience, yung moral condition or yung transformative. So, kasama doon yung sanctification, right? Yung prior probably being sanctified by God differently than myself, ako. So, that becomes a subjective thing. Okay? So, malinaw ba yun? Okay, good. Alright. And so, this concept, to let you guys know, sinabi ko rin kanina, the ground of justification is basically Christ's righteousness. Alam na natin yun. Right? It's not because of our own works or our own merits. Now, how do we go about having the righteousness of Christ? That is the, that is yung question sa atin ngayon. Okay? How do we go about having that righteousness of Christ? This is what we're going to tackle this afternoon. But first, let us define what is what justification is. Now, the Westminster Shorter Catechism defines justification as an act of God's free grace, wherein He pardoneth, He pardons all our sins, and accepts us as righteous in His sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. Later on, he uh, will define what imputation or impute means. Now, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism defines justification as, a, as an act of God, not the act of man. Okay? We're in, so in justification, that is where God pardons the sinner. He forgives the sins of the person. That is justification. What else? Twofold ang, ang work ni God sa justification. He pardons the sin and then what? He accepts us as righteous in His sight. Okay? So He looks at us having no sin but having also the righteousness. Okay? So that is how Westminster Shorter Catechism defines it. Now let's look at the Confession of Faith in 1689. Those God effectually calls, He also freely justifies. So, yung mga author ng 1689, they're saying that if you have been effectually called, you will also be justified. He does this not by infusing righteousness. Now, what do you mean by infuse? Infuse means, si God mismo yung ginagawa righteous, ikaw mismo righteous ka na. But that is not how justification works. Because we're still sinners and we continue to sin. In fact, we struggle, uh, we, we battle with sin. So he does this not by infusing righteousness into them, but what? Again, in the next like Westminster Shorter Match Catechism, but by pardoning their sins. Okay? Pardon sa parang sa court. Napapardon yung isang criminal. By, but by pardoning their sins and accounting, so you see this parang mathematical, no? May bawas and then mayroong dinadagdag. Right? There is a pardoning of sins and then there is an accounting or accepting them as righteous. Okay? He does this for Christ's sake alone and not for anything produced in them or done by them. He does not impute faith itself, the act of believing, or any other gospel obedience to them as their righteousness. Instead, He imputes Christ's active obedience. Again, later on, we will uh, uh, tackle that. Uh, he imputes to uh, Christ's uh, active obedience to the whole law and passive obedience in His death as their whole and only righteousness by faith. Faith is self-generated, it is the difference. Don't worry, later on we will explain this. Okay? Now let's look at some systematic theology books. One from Gerhardus Voss, his Reformed Dogmatics, he defines justification as a judicial assigning. Judicial assigning to the sinner. Parang ina-assign niya sa isang sinner ang what? Isang status of being a righteous uh, it will be in righteous. So again, God does not infuse righteousness. He does not make you righteous, but He declares you righteous. There is a difference. Okay? So, assigning to the sinner of the status of righteousness on the basis of the merits of Christ, imputed to Him by God, in which in faith He places His trust. 
So that is justification. Now, in order for us to understand that, we need to understand the actual process that happens in justification. First, we need to understand that God Himself requires a perfect righteousness according to the law. Okay? He expects us to be holy. Diba? May command sa Peter. For, we, for He is holy. We must be holy for He is holy. There is a, an expectation from God. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. See, there is an expectation to abide in all things that are written in the book of the law. We are expected to, to obey the law of God and to achieve perfect righteousness. In Romans chapter 2 verse 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Those who are able to actually do the law of God. And in Matthew chapter 5 verse 20 and verse 48, Christ said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 48, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There is an expectation from God for us to pursue perfect righteousness by abiding, by obeying His law. So then we understand that the law of God wasn't just given as a way of life, but there was an expectation to be holy and to be perfectly righteous. So that's point number one. Point number two. Adam, as the representative of mankind, sinned. And his guilt or his sin was imputed to his posterity or descendants. Okay? Again, Adam was made a representative of all of the whole mankind. And ibig sabihin ng representative, whatever the representative does, ganun din yung ginawa ng mga nire-represent niya. Okay? So if Adam sinned, then therefore, tayong lahat have sinned and are guilty. Okay? In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, it says here, how God made Adam originally an upright person, a good person. See? See, this alone they found that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. So originally, he was made to, to maintain that righteousness. Okay? He was the, in that kind of status before he actually sinned. Nehemiah Cox said in his book, Covenant Theology from Adam to Christ, he said, God made him a reasonable creature and endued him, Adam, with original righteousness, okay? which was a perfection necessary to enable him to answer the end of his creation. So God made Adam morally right. And being created after the likeness of God, I mean, God created Adam in his likeness. And he was supposed to live a holy life. Adam, just like how God was holy. He was supposed to live righteously, just like how God is righteous. Now that that in itself is law. That in itself is law. And knowing Adam, Adam knowing that he was created in the likeness of God, and God, as we know, is a holy God, then the expectation for Adam is to live a perfect and holy life. So doon pa lang sa, sa, sa garden, meron ng batas, meron ng expectation kay Adam na gumawa na hindi sumuway sa batas ng Panginoon. But as we know, and by the way, this was his expectation, so in, in a diagram, si Adam, he was supposed to maintain righteousness by, of course, obeying the law of God. By not disobeying. Ano ba yung isang, uh, ano ba yung sinabi ni God na kailangan hindi niya gawin? Huwag niya kakainin. Yo, 
fruit. But he wasn't, of course, we know he sinned. He wasn't able to maintain that righteousness. And so, he, uh, lahat, uh, this sin has been, uh, him being a representative of mankind, parang na represent niya yung mankind and yung mankind now are of course sinners and guilty okay so this is what he did instead of maintaining righteousness he became guilty because of his sins and Romans Paul says in Romans chapter 5 verses 12 to 13 therefore just as sin came into the world through one man this is Adam just as sin came into the world through one man, si Adam, and death through sin, meaning yung kamatayan ay pumasok na rin sa mundo dahil pinasok ni Adam ang kasalanan. And so death spread to all men because all sin. Dahil nagkasala si Adam, nagkaroon ng kamatayan. Imagine, before, uh, before the fall, si Adam and Eve, walang kamatayan noon. Dahil nagkasala sila, nagkaroon na ng kamatayan. Remember, may, may pinatay na hayop ang Panginoon para gamitin yung balat at isuot ni Adam and Eve. Yun yung unang kamatayan. Right? Physical death. And so, because of that, yung kasalanan ni Adam at Eve, ni Adan, kumalat sa, sa buong mundo dahil siya ay representative ng mankind. That is why all of us as well, physically die. Lahat tayo ay namamatay. Okay? So this is a picture of that. Si Adam yung nasa taas. Again, we are not the ones who fell into sin in Eden, but Adam's fall into sin in Eden is the fall of a representative. And what a representative does he brings with him all that he represented. So Adam's sin, Adam's guilt becomes everyone's sin, becomes everyone's guilt. Yes, but yung baby na kapanganak pa lang ay guilty of sin because of what Adam did. So again, this big as all sinners. And that is what you call imputation or the word impute, meaning ng impute to represent or to credit into the into your account. That is an accounting term. Okay? So Adam's sin, Adam's guilt imputed to mankind. Yun yung uktaw na una imputation na nangyari. Later on, papakita ko sa inyo na mayroon pang mga susunod na imputation. So Again, we know now that we have we are all sinners because of what Adam did. Uh, paboritong illustration ng isa sa mga kaibigan namin pastor na sinasabi niya na ang mga, eh, mga bata hindi mo na tinuturuan maging masama kasi by nature they are they will do such things. Tuturuan mo siya ng mabuti. Right? Because tayo, in our nature, we are all sinners. Okay? So, again, for all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and because of our sins, we are all guilty. And the wages of sin, as we know, is death. Because we are sinners, we are all condemned. And as creatures, we have a creature-creator relationship with God, our Creator. And part of that relationship is that we obey the Creator's Law. Okay? But those who do not believe in God do not want to be part of this inescapable relationship. They don't want to obey this inescapable law. And so because of this, this, this disobedience, everyone else, everyone is guilty. So again, when it comes to the law of God, we are all guilty and we are all condemned. That is, that is one reason as well why God has given the law to Moses. Just for us to know how sinful we are. That does not mean that the law of God did not exist prior God giving the law on the tablets of stone. No. Pinakita lang sa atin na ito talaga, number na ng Panginoon ang law niya. Okay, ngayon alam ko na how sinful I am. But the law has been existing even before Adam. 
I mean, during in, in the Garden of Eden. So again, because of the law of God, we know that we are sinners and we all, we all know that we are guilty. That is our status. Status natin yun. We are all guilty. So for a guilty sinner, we always disobey the law. Okay? And because of this, of course, we also have this nature. Yung, yung, lagi natin, if we have God and sin, we will always choose sin over God. Diba? Yun nga yung use ng regeneration. The Holy Spirit must change us first for us to be able to choose God. To, to put our trust and faith in God. Sabi nga ni Paul sa Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which, ones, in which you once walked. Now Paul, kinocompare tayo ni Paul dito sa corpse. And he used a Greek word that described corpse. Talagang patay. But then in the next verse it says, In which you once walked. Anong ibig mo sabihin, uh, Paul? Sige sabi mo, patay kami, pero naglalakad. That does, Paul just meant na hindi yung physical death. It means a spiritual death. That we have been walking, following the course of this world, following Satan, and we are, we are sabi pa nga ni Paul, we are children of wrath. That is our destination. So again, we always disobey God. It confirms that we are sinners, we have the law of God that shows, and that shows to us our sinfulness. Now, when we talk about the law, the law imposes two things. The law imposes two things, ten commandments, two things. One is precepts, and the other is punishment. Pre precepts or requirements. The law has its precepts, the law has its requirements, and if you fail, to obey such precepts, if you fail to fulfill the precepts, you will be punished. So these are the two things that the law imposes. And so we try to obey the precepts of the law, but we cannot do it, and so we are to be punished. <coughs> and this is why Christ came into the world. He became the substitute for us. And that is my point number three. Jesus Christ, in His obedient life and atoning death, fully satisfied the precepts and the penalty of the law. Let's look at that again. Jesus Christ, of course we know He died, in His passive obedience. What do you mean by passive obedience? Ibig sabihin, passive, what happened to Him? Uh, he was the recipient of the action, passive. So it refers to His submission to the punishment for sin that He received in the hands of God on the cross. He was obeying God. Yung pagkamatay na sa cross, inobey niya ang God the Father. Okay? But this is a passive obedience. It meaning, wala nakataka ganyan lang siya, passive, hindi siya aktibo. Okay, yun yung kapalitara. Right? He submits to the call of God to be on the receiving end of God's judgment in our behalf. Now take note. We are supposed to be punished because we always fail to obey the precepts of the law. But it was Christ who was punished in the Christian's life, uh, life's behalf. So in Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 25, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. Propitiation means satisfaction. Siya yung naging abyss. Yung ginawa niya. Take God the Father. But again, he did not just satisfy the required punishment. He also satisfied the precepts. He lived a sinless life. Now, ito naman yung active obedience ni Christ. Kung kanina, ang passive obedience niya is yung hinayaan niya sa hindi niya voluntarily died on the cross to be the punishment and then, well, before that happened,
and in his life, he actively obeyed God by actively obeying or fulfilling the precepts of the law. And take note, in doing so, he has achieved the perfect righteousness that God the Father himself is requiring us. Remember our, our, our point number one, God requires perfect righteousness, but it was Christ who did that for the sake of the Christians. In his active obedience and in his passive obedience. In Romans chapter 8, verses 3 to 4, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his son, his own son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Paul is saying here that Christ never walked according to the flesh. He was sinless. He obeyed the precepts of the law. And one of our testimony to this is when Adam was tempted, he failed. But as we have read a while ago in Matthew chapter 4, he was tempted three times by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights, and he never failed. That shows to us the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Also in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. For sure, hindi na yun yung temptation na nangyari. In case Satan, sabi rito, he has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So again, all that the law imposes, the precepts and the penalty, Jesus took. Alright, and our fourth point, all our guilt was born or carried by Christ on the cross. Remember a while ago, we saw how Adam's sin and Adam's guilt were imputed to mankind. How the sin of Adam was credited to mankind. Now, in justification, there are two other imputations. Parang galing din, what happened to Adam and to mankind. The negative and the positive. The negative is that all our guilt, remember, lahat tayong ay guilty, lahat tayong may makasalanan, but if we respond to Christ in faith, our guilt will now be imputed to Christ on the cross. And this is the picture of that. So imagine yung hindi po nila at, ibig sabihin, hindi atik yung iba. <laughs> so, the next guilt and sin imputed. <laughs> the next guilt and sin imputed to Christ. Okay? God imputes the sin of the elect to Christ when the elect responds in faith. Now again, warning, this does not infuse sins to Christ. Because if we say that this is an infused righteousness, we're saying that Christ is a sinner. Christ became a sinner, but that is not the case. It is a judicial imputation of the sin of the elect. The picture is like this in the Old Testament when the high priest puts his hand on the head of the sheep and he prays. That is a picture of the coming imputation. Okay? They were crediting the sinner's account to the sheep and the sheep will be killed and sacrificed. Okay? But as we know, this, is not, this was not meant to last. Kasi every sin has to be atoned for by a sheep or by an animal. But now we know that we have a one-time event by a one sheep, the sacrificial lamb who became our sacrifice. Hindi na namin ito kailangan gawin. Now, this is a picture of the imputation. Jesus Christ, ano lang yan? Uh, diagram lang yan. And then this is the believer. Uh, this represents the sins, yung mga parang tinfold na pula. 
And then yung righteousness ni Jesus Christ yung puti. Okay? And so, in justification, when we respond to Christ in faith, our sin is imputed to Christ. See, other diagrams, uh, they, they, what they do is nilalagay nila papunta dito. Mamaya mapakita ko din yun. But, I want, gusto ko lang makita niyo yung point kung bakit dito yung ginawa kong diagram. When we respond to Christ in faith, our sin is imputed to Christ. But if this is the only thing that happens, kung ganyan lang, then magiging neutral lang tayo, basically, sa paningin ng Diyos. Or as sinners, sinners pa rin. Kasi yung sin natin, yung guilt natin, napunta lang kay Christ. That does not earn us an eternal communion with God the Father in the future. That is why another imputation must happen. And that is the imputation of Christ's righteousness. Sabi kanina sa, sa definition natin, pardoning our sins. This is the pardoning of sins. But, ano an yung second step? We have to be accepted as righteous. And that is the second imputation, which, ay sorry, which is later. Sorry. So anyway, mamaya na pa yun. Ito pala yan, sorry. Uh, sorry. Hello? This, okay. This one. So, in it, napakaroon ka lang ako. So, yan. So, the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us as a status. Righteous as a status. Uh, guilt, again, to Christ as a status. And then, when Christ the Father, when God the Father looks at us, He looks at us this way. Victory, righteous, and then sinner. Okay? Now, other diagrams show this. Okay lang naman yun kung ganyan. Kung ganyan, and kung ganyan. Wala mga problema. But, I don't just, I just don't want everyone to think that this is infused. Right? Because if you look at it, it looks like the sin was infused to Christ, making him a, an actual sinner. And the righteousness is infused to the sinner, making the sinner a righteous person. But we are not made righteous, but we are declared righteous. Okay, so now you understand what we Okay, so, and then uh, the fifth, which I already have told you, all our righteousness is on the ground of Christ's perfect righteousness. Okay? Romans chapter 3 verse 26 It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He is the one who gives us His righteousness and He remains just. He maintains His justice and He also justifies. He provides the righteousness. It is His righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake, He made Him to be sin. This is not to be misinterpreted as Christ becoming a sinner. Who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Again, this is not to interpret that all of us were made righteous. Wala pa tayo sa glorification for us to be made righteous. Now again, thinking of the concept of imputation, this is more like God the Father treating the sinner as righteous even though he is not righteous. God the Father treating Jesus Christ as a sinner even though he is not a sinner. Okay? Sabi nga ni R.C. Sproul, who by the way, uh, death anniversary niya kahapon? Kahapon ba? It is for this reason Luther and the Reformers insisted that the righteousness by which we are justified is a righteousness that is extranos in Latin, which means outside of or apart from. Na yung righteousness na yon ay hindi galing sa atin, nakita niyo sa diagram, galing yon kay Christ. It is a justitia alienum, an alien righteousness or foreign righteousness. Alien, galing sa labas, hindi galing sa loob. A righteousness given by another on our behalf. Okay? So, justification does not make the believer righteous. It declares legally that in Christ the sinner is righteous 
It is a status before God, not an experience within. It does not make the sinner actually righteous because if that's the case, then one might think that it is his merit. It, it is because of him. But because it is a righteousness that is not ours, that is, come from, that is coming from Christ, then the merit remains that of Christ. So looking at our Ordo Salutis, regeneration is the change within our hearts. The Holy Spirit changes us, yung loob natin. But a justification, adoption, and reconciliation is a change of status. It is an objective status. And to the one who does not work but believes in Him, who justifies the ungodly. Now this makes sense. We are justified and Paul co still calls the sinner as ungodly. He justifies the ungodly. Okay? And again, this makes possible the statement of Martin Luther, simul justus et peccator. Simul means say, uh, at the same time, justus meaning justified, et meaning end, and peccator means sinner simultaneously just and a sinner and that is our uh, the end of our topic for today and the next topic not sure kung next week kasi we might tackle the origin of christmas next week but our next topic for our soteriology is justification by faith alone which is the means so we now we understand the ground now ano naman yung means of justification Faith alone.